All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? So my name is Joe Choate. I'm the state election director for Colorado. And I'm also the president of the board of advisors to the Certificate of Elect uh, Elections Administration Program at the University of Minnesota at the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Uh, it's great to be here with you again. Uh, we do these webinars every other month. I say bi-monthly, but then people argue with me about whether that's twice a month or every other. We do them bi-monthly and it's every other. So um, this is our December one. We'll have another one scheduled in February, but we don't know what our topic is for that one yet, but we will get that information to you very shortly so that you can put that on your calendar as well. But today we're gonna to talk about artificial intelligence and elections. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about the CEA program and then we'll kick off the actual presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, you can on your screen either accept a live transcript so you can watch the live text of the speech and then uh, also uh, provide questions that I will curate and um, try to sort of identify the appropriate questions uh, to have Michael answer as uh, he ends his presentation. We should have you know 15 minutes or so for questions at the end of this, maybe even 20. Uh, so definitely send me those. We'll uh, sort of identify the uh, questions that, that kind of make sense. If your question doesn't get asked, there's very, it's a very high likelihood that I had two or three that were very similar. So, uh, so you should not let that deter you. You should uh, definitely send us uh, questions. Uh, the Certificate Elections Administration Program is uh, our elections um, education program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, it's a pioneering program, which we began several years ago to uh, create these classes on best practices and um, have them taught by current election officials uh, to prepare students to become elections professionals themselves. Really, it's one of the few, if not the only, um, election administration um, uh, program like teaching to create election administrators in the uh, United States. So, um, and it's a great program. The certificate itself uh, requires 12 credit hours, which uh, comes out to about maybe five or six classes, depending upon the ones you take. Uh, they are all online and they're all accessible 24 hours a day. So uh, there are some live classes, but for the most part, you can do all the work um, at your leisure. We have a great uh, placement record. In fact, nearly a perfect uh, placement record for those that want to go into the profession and go through our certificate program. In fact, in Colorado, I know of several people who have successfully uh, been through the program or even just taken classes in the program and uh, now work as election professionals. There, there are people running elections in Colorado who went through the University of Minnesota program. So if you wanna learn more information, that's a great email address uh, to uh, track down uh, the CEA folks and ask your questions. Uh, there are two different ways that you can participate as a student in the CEA program at the University of Minnesota. The first is the full certificate program. So that's the 12 hours. And that'll be taking five or six classes over the course of you know one or two or three semesters however long it takes you. Uh, if you want to apply for that full program uh, this upcoming semester, you can apply January 3rd, by January 3rd. And um, I've, I'll describe a little bit of what you're going to do to apply. It's really not very difficult. And uh, the other option is to just take a class, see, what, see if you like it, see what you learn. And then you can always sign up for the full certificate at your leisure. If you want to learn more about uh, the program and the classes, uh, it's z.umn.edu and then slash hhhcea, or what I always do, which is put in hhhcea in a search engine. That's the first thing that pops up, come, comes right up, hhhcea. Uh, the admission pro uh, process for the certificate program is very simple. You do an application, you submit a resume, and you do a cover letter basically saying, uh, why you want to be in election administration. 
Um, and then uh, there are a couple of email addresses to send in your applications. This upcoming spring, we have two courses that start in January, and then we have another course that starts in March. Uh, you'll see that top one there is taught by somebody named Judd Cho. I don't know who that is. Uh, it's elections in the law. And I just, uh, this will sound like uh, back padding on my part, but um, it's actually a great course. It's really, you learn a lot about elections administration and sort of the legal foundation of where elections administration comes from. The Voting Rights Act, the Help America Vote Act, the National Voter Registration Act, uh, the uh, various military and overseas acts on view of how and move. And then we go into Supreme Court decisions like Shelby and Kustad and uh, Purcell, and we really sort of dive deep into some of these uh, important uh, both cases and laws, which really make up the <clears throat> the basis of um, all election programs in the in the country. So, uh, really interesting course, and I encourage you all to sign up. That one starts in January, goes all semester, so that goes almost to May first. And then Gina Gina Roberts uh, from Arizona, who's at the Citizen Clean Elections Commission. Uh, she teaches a half semester course on voter participation. And you see there that Maurice Turner teaches an election security class, which is sort of the umbrella class of our election security uh, uh, triumvirate. We have three of them. And he's teaching that class uh, starting in the middle of the semester, so in March. So that's a class that Michael Mosier should attend, because, or maybe he should teach it. Uh, but he's the guy that used to be. Uh, election security pro at the uh, Pennsylvania Department of State. So, and you'll hear all about him. All right, so today uh, you're gonna hear about artificial intelligence and elections. This has been a big topic. It's one that we're all sort of talking about and grappling with. There's great concerns about the ways that um, uh, AI could be used to manipulate uh, both the administration of elections, but probably more so uh, those things related to campaigns and campaign finance, um, perhaps ethics and lobbyists, that kind of work. So uh, it's really um, a very uh, timely topic. And we have those, the perfect speaker to come and talk to us. Uh, Michael Mosier is uh, an election security analyst at CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, that is a an office of the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, Michael is right in the uh, in the soup of all of these very difficult questions. Look, Leo is joining us. Um, and uh, uh, Michael really uh, knows and appreciates all the issues that face elections administrators regarding AI. Um, so, and I know Michael, as I referenced, from the fact that he used to work at the Pennsylvania Department of State and was the election security guy there and uh, was always at all of our and we've got a chance to, to meet. And, um, when I had a chance to do something on AI, I said, hey, Michael, we need you to come and do this. So we're really lucky to have it today. Uh, Michael, why don't I hand it off to you and I will take down my screen so you can put up yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Judd. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, and really appreciate the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, not only CISA's election security mission, but also um, this really timely topic and certainly a topic that's been pretty prevalent um, nationwide in the news, et cetera, on uh, artificial intelligence and certainly with elections and, and potential risks. Uh, so appreciate the opportunity and excited to be here with you all. Um, as Judd mentioned earlier, uh, please don't hesitate to throw in questions. Um, be happy to help answer whatever at the end through uh, Q&A. Um, and or certainly if something's unclear as we, we go through out the presentation. Uh, so a little bit about me, uh, Judd uh, touched on this uh, a little bit, and uh, uh, currently I reside within um, the National Risk Management Center in the uh, Election Security Resilience Subdivision um, on the Engagement Assistance and Training Team. And, and really that all just means that I get to be here and chat with you all today and, and our election stakeholders uh, across the country. Uh, so I, uh, uh, CISA, uh, I support election engagements, help provide subject matter expertise and, and support content and resource development. And you're really in support of election officials and building resilience within the community. 
Um, as Judd mentioned, prior to my time at uh, CISA, I had the privilege of working at the Pennsylvania Department of State and helped to minister elections within the Commonwealth. Initially, I served as the Deputy Commissioner of Elections for a few years. And then in the latter half of my tenure with the department, I was the Director of Election Security and Technology. In those capacities, I had the opportunity to work closely with our, our election officials across the Commonwealth, uh, vendors, uh, community stakeholders, interagency partners uh, to help advance accessibility, security, and election operation. Uh, some of the um, fun opportunities that I had and um, that helped make a, a profound impact within the Commonwealth was helping to implement online voter registration and including the ability for um, third party registration drive to um, adopt a, an API for voter registration, as well as launching an online absentee ballot request application. And I also helped lead the Commonwealth's efforts to modernize the election code following some of our historical overhaul in 2019 and 2020. So I had, a, um, I had the privilege of working there for about six years, and, and now I'm here with the, the CISA team. Um, so to kick off the discussion, I just want to spend a few minutes providing some background um, for some of our newer officials or those that aren't as familiar with uh, CISA's election security mission and also discuss the evolution of uh, threats against elections since 2016. I really think that'll help provide some context uh, before we jump into AI and elections. So a little bit about uh, CISA and how election infrastructure uh, was designated as what's referred to as critical infrastructure. Um, our role goes all the way back to 2017, following Russian interference in the 2016 election cycle. So in January of that year, the Department of Homeland Security designated election infrastructure, um, which would be like your facilities, people, um, the equipment, uh, you know, and polling location, all those core components that support elections, um, that got designated as critical infrastructure. And really what that designation did is it provided a basis for the department to um, come together with other federal agencies to help prioritize resources and support to enhance security and resilience for elections. So at, at CISA, what we specifically do is that we help coordinate with the intelligence community, uh, federal law enforcement, private industry partners to provide alerts and other information that, that seeks to inform uh, election stakeholders understanding of uh, what the threat landscape looks like, um, to help inform their risk management decisions. We also provide uh, voluntary no-cost cyber and fiscal security services to help election stakeholders uh, manage risk to their systems and infrastructure. With that said, I just want to clear, make it clear that our prime focus is really on security of systems and infrastructure. We are not involved with election administration or voter engagements. Those decisions fall uh, to state and local policies. So as I said, 2016 was really the catalyst for what precipitated today's partnership between uh, state, local, and federal entities to further secure and coordinate protection of election infrastructure. You know, so while election officials have done a, a tremendous job, I mean, they can't give them enough credit for all the hard work they do uh, day in, day out, um, all throughout the year. It's not just once or twice a year. Uh, but they they spent a tremendous amount of time securing the infrastructure, uh, but there's always uh, opportunities for improvement. Giving uh, technology and tactics are always evolving, which means that mitigations and defense measures also need to evolve to meet those um, emerging threats. Um, so many of the same sophisticated cyber actors that we saw in 2016 and certainly in more recent election cycles. Um, are also the same ones that are directing disinformation and foreign influence campaigns. So those influence campaigns can also be cyber enabled, meaning that they're relying on, say, illicitly obtained information or they're making false or inflated claims of cyber compromise. But their end goal is really not just to show discord uh, or undermine confidence elections or our democratic institutions, but their disinformation can also be about election processes themselves. So emerging technology such as uh, artificial intelligence can really make a, a, a large scale impact 
um, and increase the effectiveness of, of those types of attacks against election infrastructure. Um, however, that risk has also evolved over time. It's not just solely focused on cyber and influence campaigns anymore. Uh, it also has grown to include physical threats to election facilities and, and, and personnel. Sometimes it's, that's um, individuals acting on uh, perceived information or outcomes of an election, um, and they, they take a, a violent turn or, or make threats against an official. So in response to that a shift of threat to the physical security environment, the Department of Justice in uh, 2021 stood up a task force on threats to election workers. That led to a handful of prosecutions, um, ongoing investigations, uh, and really thousands of reports that are helping to inform the federal government's understanding of potential threats to uh, election officials. In addition to the regular uh, coordination that uh, we do with state and local election officials, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and, and subsequently CISA uh, attempt to share threat information as much as possible to help election officials uh, make more informed decisions. Um, so uh, for those that are aware of what used to be uh, known as the National Terrorism Advisory System or NTAS bulletins, um, there's now a, an annual homeland threat assessment that shares prevailing threat levels to the homeland on critical infrastructure. Um, so these annual assessments have uh, since replaced um, the end test bulletins. So what does all that jargon mean? Uh, really what it means is that um, the annual assessment is a mechanism to communicate information about potential threats to the American public. It's really to help intend uh, to help increase awareness of heightened risk of terrorist attack in the United States by providing timely and detailed information. So that the assessment reflects the insights from across the department, uh, intelligence community, other stakeholders, and going forward, this is gonna serve as the primary mechanism for articulating potential threats. Um, and then NTAS bulletins will be reserved for more uh, nuanced or specific or imminent threats versus the annual assessment. And I share this for a few reasons. It, 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 one, it's a great resource for the public and election officials to help you know, contextualize potential threats in all in one, one report. Uh, and it also has some synthesized context around the use of artificial intelligence and other tactics in elections by adversaries that I think are helpful to address up front and, and to keep in mind as we dig in, in today's uh, presentation. But generally, when it comes to the 2024 election cycle, our election processes are going to remain an attractive target for many adversaries. So threat actors likely remain, are going to likely remain opportunistic in their targeting of election related networks and data, in addition to potential disinformation campaigns to undermine uh, trust in the process. Um, and this would include the use of artificial intelligence either to um, exacerbate existing techniques for cyber intrusion or um, scaling disinformation campaigns to um, sow to confusion uh, with voters in the public. Uh, but you can easily find this assessment. You can just go to a search engine, Google uh, DHS Homeland Threat Assessment, and it'll likely be your first option that pops up on screen. Very much recommend it if you're looking for an interesting read or backdrop on to ongoing threats to the nation. Um, and then before we get into it, I just want to kind of cover what um, adversaries look like. I mean, elections are incredibly diverse and involve various forms of both digital and physical infrastructure. And due to the underlying makeup of election infrastructure and certainly the public facing nature of elections, threats can take various forms and adversaries have varying capabilities to impact election infrastructure regardless of those motives, any perceived threat can impact operations. For example, public conference can be undermined, uh, facilities can be targeted, and that threatens the personal safety of election workers and voters or disrupts operations during critical voting periods. So throughout the upcoming discussion, uh, I, wanna, I want you to all to kind of keep this slide in mind as we continue to progress. It, I think it helps define what those potential threats can look like and explain the types of adversaries, election officials, and other critical infrastructure sectors might 
uh, experience. You know, I set adversaries and threats a few times, and this is really what I'm meaning by those by those terms. So, like adversaries are are essentially uh, like terrorists that can be foreign or domestic. So this is like nation state actors or other countries and criminal groups and uh, or lone wolf actors um, that are either attempting to um, pursue some sort of disruption or outcome um, that essentially is perceived to their benefit. So that the, the, the various motivations can can vary from each group. But in the middle there, um, there are some area, there's some motivations that might help contextualize why adversaries are targeting election infrastructure. Either they're seeking financial gain, they have their own foreign policy agenda, um, or they're just trying to kind of ferment chaos and anarchy in the process. Um, regardless of who the adversary is and what the motivation is, they're essentially going to target um, elections um, because it's it's really core to our democracy. Um, and some of those targets might look like uh, them trying to get at the voter registration database, polling places, personnel, or, or public information channels such as social media, et cetera. But again, these are all examples that I just want you to keep in mind as we explore the malicious use of AI in elections as we continue uh, into the presentation. So now that we've kind of covered the 101 of CISA's election security mission and it took a quick look at what the threat environment looks like surrounding elections, I really want to now I start want to start delving into the today's focus artificial intelligence. You know, just a few quick disclaimers as we dig in here. First, Generate AI, it does change the risk scape for election infrastructure. However, I don't want anyone to panic uh, with, with AI, you know, kind of being a, you know, some would see it as a new player in the field, you know, but it's been around for a while and it really just uh, changes the potential scale and impact of um, tar targeting election infrastructure. So this presentation is really not to cause harm. You know, it's really just a level set on what AI is and how it can be used to target elections. Many of the risks discussed here are ones election officials have faced before, so officials are not starting from scratch and defending against the risks. Uh, another disclaimer is that this presentation is more focused on risks to election infrastructure from a malicious actor's perspective when using AI. Um, so, but I do want to recognize that while AI will undoubtedly have a, a profound impact on society, today's presentation doesn't explicitly cover the risks that state or local governments or election officials uh, might see when they're trying to use the AI tools themselves. Um, there are certainly risks and benefits in those cases, um, but again, they're not explicitly covered. Although I do want to take a moment to, to highlight some of the potential, you know, quote unquote, positive applications, if you will. Um, as we before um, continuing, you know, so what? So what does some of the beneficial use cases look like? You know, so for background purposes, some of those use cases could look like uh, automating or scaling um, threat detection. Uh, essentially, uh, they're able to use uh, AI. Organizations can use AI to give them uh, deeper visibility into their to their data. You know, they might use machine learning to identify patterns, you know, indicative of cyber threats, such as analyzing network traffic for unusual behavior, um, or could be recognizing malware signatures and identifying previously unseen threats. Um, and then, uh, so they can use that to um, essentially um, stop attacks um, before they have a really big impact on their their systems, data, whatever it might be. Um, they could also use AI to help prevent um, phishing or social engineering exploits. You know, they're able to use what's referred to as natural language processing to recognize suspicious content or suspicious communication patterns. They can, um, entities can use AI to generate content to assemble draft communications like an email or um, a letter in response to a constituent inquiry before they apply final edits to it. Uh, AI can be used to generate code, software code, it, you know, or it can be used to help explain what code does and what it means and, and maybe help verify some of the code that has been written. 
Uh, or AI can be used to help discover answers to questions, such as a chatbot to provide users with helpful information or areas to find more information on the topic. You know, that could be deployed to both the public or voters, or it could be deployed to frontline staff to help prioritize and answer inquiries or you know, be like a, a first stop shop for you know, quick high level answers um, when dealing with common frequently asked questions. Um, this certainly isn't an exhausted list, but uh, I do hope it helps contextualize some different ways in which it can impact an organization positively and help identify efficiencies and, and process improvement. So what is artificial intelligence? Um, there's really no universally accepted definition. Uh, the definition that you see on screen here is, is what CISA uses. Uh, but it, at its most basic, AI is the science of getting computers and, to perform tasks requiring human intelligence. You know, in other words, they're systems capable of performing tasks like people. At, the, at its core basic level, the systems are designed to really have the ability to think, uh, to learn, and to adapt to the environment, such as analyzing data to understand and predict patterns. Um, that's probably a really overly simplified explanation, but um, I think that's worth noting uh, for those that are just kind of getting exposed to AI for the for the first time. Uh, a helpful analogy that I previously saw online could be teaching uh, a system to play chess. Initially, it doesn't know how much it doesn't know much about the game of chess, right? Now, however, as it as it plays more, it's going to learn the game, learns. Um, from its mistakes, sees what their opponents are doing, and it becomes better over time. You know, eventually it could become really good at it. From a personal perspective, um, I'll say it probably wouldn't take much to train a, an AI system to beat me at chess because I'm a terrible player. However, the point is still the same. A computer or system can think, uh, learn, and adapt to the game itself, learn patterns and moves, and counteract what they're seeing. So a couple, a couple of big ideas here that differentiate a machine that follows predefined rules, like a calculator, and one that uses artificial intelligence. Generally, AI involves the process of collecting information in the form of data. So it's sorting and storing the data, learning from what is stored uh, to perform whatever the tasks might be. And that data can be numbers, words, images, and so on. A machine uses that data to do things uh, like make predictions about what you want to listen to, recognize faces, defend against cyber intrusion, or in my earlier chess admission, predict chess moves against a really bad chess player. Um, but AI requires vast amounts of data, um, a lot of computing power, and algorithms that determine what the output should be. And it's really a, both a hardware and a software component to the AI systems. So there are several subfields of AI, like uh, computer vision and machine learning, that uh, roughly correspond to different components of human capabilities. Um, but the, the subfields aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. So can it see, right? Uh, like, for example, can a computer recognize what it sees? Um, then it's most likely using AI. It's what differentiates a cat filter that maps to your face uh, and makes you look like a cat from a normal cat. Or um, what device gets, or when your device gets unlocked with your face, it's using machine learning to analyze your face. Can it hear? If you speak to a computer and it responds in a useful, sensible, or a way and transcribes what you say, it's using AI. You know, a great example are voice assistants. Can it read? So same goes for reading. If you write to a chatbot and it responds in a useful, sensible way, it's using AI. And it can it move. You know, if you encounter a robot that can perceive and understand its environment on its own, then it's using AI. Uh, like, so like a remote control toy car, that's not using AI, but an autonomous vehicle does. Uh, and finally, can it reason? This last category, machine learning, is a is a big one. So most applications of AI you hear. Um, refer to machine learning. Um, so like, uh, although I can't see it, if we were in person, I would ask how many folks, raise your hand, how many folks get recommendations in their streaming service, right? 
that's probably most of us on this webinar, and that's a form of AI. Um, or have you gotten um, product or shopping recommendations from retailers? Um, that's that's all a form of machine learning. The core idea is that a machine learning system is taking massive amounts of data, it's looking for patterns and making connections, and then produced as an output based on that data. In an elections context, uh, some jurisdictions are already using machine learning to automate tasks like um, uh, signature verification, um, coupled with human verification by um, comparing signatures found on mail-in ballots with those in voters' files. Um, other jurisdictions are exploring uh, chatbots or other capabilities to filter through information requests uh, or support frontline staff, uh, such as what I mentioned earlier, um, with operational questions. Um, but machine learning is really the basis of uh, many breakthroughs in AI, um, including what I'm going to talk about next, which is generative AI. So some of the headlines that you see on screen um, about how deep fakes, AI generated disinformation, or synthetic media threading elections, they, they might look familiar. Um, these are all headlines referring to generative AI. Um, it's it's a it's a broad term that can really be used for any system whose main function is to generate content. So generative AI uses machine learning to find those patterns in data uh, used to train the model and generates new data that has uh, similar characteristics. So uh, for example, a model that generates images is trained on a huge database of images. Um, Deepfakes. Uh, this is a type of generative AI. It refers to content that has been altered by AI to make it appear that a person is doing or, or saying something that a person never did or said. Um, and within elections, much of the focus on generative AI has been describing hypothetical election scenarios. Uh, on the next few slides, you know, I'll cover what different generative AI capabilities are and some known malicious um, actors and how they're actually um deploying such technology uh, in the field that way when we we can think about um, how they might use the tools to target elections in 2024 and beyond and then um, possibly form additional mitigations to counter uh, so generative ai has been around for a while nearly a decade but the release of more advanced large language models um, last year really catapulted generative ai capabilities into the spotlight there are some well-known um, AI tools that are out there today that really continue to get a lot of press headlines, and, and they they might even be a lot of fun to interact and play with. I've done it myself. I mean, you you, you um, test out the prompts, and they give some of them give some really plausible uh, responses back to you. Um, but on this slide, you're going to see some um, general taxonomy that um, essentially is just classifying or categorizing AI. So a few I want to highlight, as I mentioned already, is a deep fake video, which is really just an AI generated, highly realistic um, synthetic media piece. Um, there's what's referred to as text to video. This produces videos from a written prompt. Uh, text to image, same thing, produces images from a written prompt. Uh, and then text to text, it produces text and supporting content from a written prompt. Um, today, the models have become so large and have digested so much content that they're able to produce convincingly written documents, uh, photo uh, realistic images, and, and maybe even clones of celebrity voices. Essentially, the models have become much more powerful than their predecessors. And the key change uh, in the environment is that uh, these very powerful models are now commercially available and more accessible to anyone. Um, so using these tools can be as simple as entering a prompt and then having the software generate whatever image, audio, or text you want. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with the text-to-text, text-to-speech, et cetera. Um, uh, but the tools are more accessible, so it really makes it much easier and less expensive for potential threat actors to create high-quality deceptive content at greater scale and speed. So on screen, we have a few examples of AI-generated content. Uh, so right there in the middle, uh, we asked to see Darth Vader voting. You know, it's certainly not perfect, but it does generate a, a somewhat reasonable image. Um, 
for our Star Wars fans on there. You're probably really excited to see this. Um, but, you know, if you look a little closer at the image, it's not exactly what you would expect in a, um, going to vote, say, on Election Day, right? Um, first and foremost, um, if you look at the ballot and the ballot box itself, it's not a typical situation that you would not have to vote on Election Day, but the ballot has some odd designs on it. It's not actually a ballot. Um, putting the Darth Vader costume aside, you know, you typically wouldn't see like a very patriotic background like that at an election facility with one massive American flag. Um, so there's some clues right off the top of the bat that um, tip you off that, it, it, you know, it's not something you would expect. But still, it's a somewhat reasonable image based on a prompt. Um, second, uh, to the right, we asked the large language model to explain the process uh, of the voting process in the poem. So it might be a little hard to see on screen, but it, it did generate a somewhat coherent poem. Um, so it just kind of speaks to um, where the technology uh, currently is, and it's continuing to get better every day. Um, so it might not be perfect today, uh, but it 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 does uh, put together uh, um, somewhat plausible content. Um, so those were just for some illustrative purposes. You might also remember warnings about deep fake videos wreaking havoc on some elections. So while this hasn't always been the case, um, um, because uh, producing highly sophisticated deep fake videos are, are still difficult, um, it has happened uh, you know, in, in a few areas. And I'm gonna talk about some recent examples here of where malicious actors um, were able to generate um, or reason generate to produce videos. So first in the top right, um, last year, pro Chinese actors used commercially available software to create AI avatars, uh, and then they used the avatars as fake news anchors for a fictitious media company called Wolf News, and that promoted pro Chinese and anti US content. In the middle there, um, in 2022, hackers accessed a Ukrainian news website and placed a deep fake video of Ukrainian President Zelensky urging Ukrainian soldiers to surrender. Um, the deep fake itself wasn't incredibly sophisticated, um, and it was quickly debunked, but it did spread fairly uh, quickly uh, online. And then finally, in the, the bottom right, uh, last year, a pair of Russian comedians created a fake live video of the mayor of Kiev and spoke with the mayors of three major European cities and um, video companies for about 15 minutes. It's not exactly clear what tech was used. Uh, but the mayor of Berlin did refer to it as a, a deep fake. So while much of the concern around deep fake videos have focused on use cases like the ones that you see depicted on screen, by far the most prevalent use of deep fakes is to harass women uh, by placing their likeness in sexually explicit videos. Um, the tactic has been weaponized against women in public office to uh, attempt to humiliate and harass them. Um, and election officials are, are facing similar and increasing threats. Um, so this use case is important to highlight. Um, uh, and uh, a majority of election officials, uh, uh, or there's a lot of women in election officials' um, uh, space. So it's that's another reason why I wanted to uh, highlight that here as well. And then finally, cyber criminals are deploying a lot of deep fakes to be facial recognition systems. So the giant individuals were able to gain access to a local government tax system this way and stole uh, 77 million. Uh, there's also been a rapid rise in the use of AI-generated profile photos on social media by disinformation actors and scammers over the past couple of years. Um, so you see on the top middle there where you have um, essentially images that are um, superimposed on each other um, in a way that kind of shows you that the eyes line perfectly, kind of revealing they are fakes, but um, th there's been a rapid proliferation of the uh, profile photos to kind of uh, throw off uh, people on social media, et cetera, that it um, could be somebody uh, attempting to scan them. Um, but the text to image generators have also caused a lot of concern. Um, uh, they're commercially available products uh, where you can input a prompt and the software generates an image based on the prompt, like the one you see uh, on the slide at the bottom. 
have uh, French President uh, Macron running away from protesters. Uh, also last year, or last May, uh, Russia Today tweeted an AI-generated photo of what appeared to be an explosion at the Pentagon, which caused the stock market to briefly uh, dip, which is the photo there uh, on the right side of the of the slide. So while the image didn't really look like the the Pentagon, there's certainly some imperfections in there. Um, it was it was quickly debunked, but um, nonetheless, there was some initial reaction to it. And, and honestly, in my first pass at it too, you, you kind of like, wow, you're kind of caught up in the moment. But once you uh, take a moment to digest it and really look at it, and then you start realizing that, um, you know, it's not something that actually occurred, especially as uh, folks were able to verify through appropriate channels. Um, in September of uh, 2023, Microsoft published a report on the Chinese actors who used AI images to influence um, disinformation operations to mimic U.S. voters uh, and to create controversy around divisive topics. Um, so these are all tools that foreign actors are experiment experimenting with. And it's not hard to imagine that uh, during an election, uh, given critical deadlines and voting periods, uh, these images can be used to increase confusion, potentially shape public opinion, and amplify division. Uh, often, you can find the most innovative uses of AI tools by financially motivated actors, you know, scammers in this instance. Um, so voice, voice cloning technology has improved over the past couple of years, and it has proven quite effective in scamming. So as the technology has progressed, the amount of data necessary uh, to clone has decreased. You know, scammers really only need a couple seconds of someone's voice to clone it and use it maliciously. Uh, in some cases, scammers have successfully impersonated high-ranking officials and, and a CEO uh, in one case to get employees uh, of a company to transfer funds. Um, you know, malicious actors can also use voice cloning to impersonate any employee to gain access to sensitive information. And, and this is what's referred to as business identity compromise. Uh, combined with uh, deep fake images or video tools, this is an area that introduces further uh, risk. And, and scammers have also used this technique against individuals, not even an election official or um, somebody that works within a business or anything like that. They deploy this to the elderly and other folks uh, to solicit funding under the guise of, say, a family member. Um, so the, the use of voice cloning technology, though, is a highly targeted and harder to detect it is harder to detect um, than an AI generated video or image. So a large language model is a type of machine learning model that can process, manipulate, um, or generate content, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, an example would be autocomplete on your phone. That's a, an example of a language model. Um, because language models can write convincing text, they can be used in phishing schemes or other social engineering attacks. So this is really uh, particularly advantageous for non-native English speakers uh, because chatbots eliminate some of the traditional tells of a, a phishing email, like a, a typo, um, where you can catch a grammatical error or potentially awkward phrasing. Chatbots can also write or debug code. Uh, and so why we haven't seen chatbots to, to um, develop totally new malware yet, um, the coding abilities of chatbots can be used to enhance the capabilities of more novice hackers. Um, there is evidence that cyber criminals are experimenting with these tools to exploit vulnerabilities. Uh, researchers are also concerned about the use of chatbots to scale um, foreign influence and disinformation operations. With um, AI tools, disinformation actors can do things like um, automate posts or compose full-length articles um, for fake news sites, and they can also make it easier to simulate election sites by producing uh, text content or HTML code. Um, and this type of AI-generated content can be a little more difficult to detect. Uh, many of the, the publicly available large language models uh, have safeguards in place so that you can't use the tools for malicious ends. So, for example, if you ask a chatbot to generate a phishing email, it, it won't. But if you change the prompt a little bit, the chatbot will write what could be a convincing phishing email. So on screen, you have um, a response to a prompt asking a chatbot to draft an email to an election official requesting that they change the password to an account. Um, 
you know, that text maybe with some editing, it could form the baseline uh, for efficiency. Now. You also see on screen um, what might be um, some of the error messages that you could get within the prompts uh, from the safeguards um, if it's asked to do something that's potentially malicious or against policy. Um, so if you see one of those error messages, it could be that the text was generated um, by an AI model. Uh, for example, in the, in the bottom right, there's a product review that actually says as an AI model. Um, so it's usually a way to get tipped off um, if you're not in the prompt directly. There's also a flip side um, to greater awareness of generative AI techniques, which is that um, people can claim that real images are actually deep fakes. Uh, this is known as the liar's dividend. There have been a couple cases where defendants have argued in court that images of them doing illegal acts were deep fakes. Uh, while the defenses haven't been successful, we, we do anticipate that we'll probably start to see uh, more of these claims that real images or audio clips are fake. Uh, an example, uh, in addition to examples I've already discussed, there are some other election specific use cases for malicious AI uh, to consider. Um, some of them, while not comprehensive, could be AI generated content for candidate filings, um, AI generated voter service requests voice cloning of election officials, uh, or how AI can be used to enhance um, previous attempts to undermine elections. Uh, so some of you might remember in, in 2022, text messages were sent to voters in a handful of states for purposely wrong voting information. And AI has the power to enhance the sophistication of this. With all that said though, uh, I think it's important uh, to not overstate the risk. Uh, right, some of that scale sounds really scary, uh, but overstating the risks of AI can increase distrust. Um, you know, so claiming you no longer trust anything you see or hear is just claiming that plays in the hands of uh, foreign propagandists. So for election officials, our public messaging should continue to focus on the safeguards we already have in place to ensure the integrity of elections uh, and that elections are inherently resilient. Election officials have always been the authoritative source for information on elections, and them continuing to tell their story can help promote accurate information. And likewise, if um, you are an election official, is seeking out your election official and knowing what are um, legitimate sources like the website or um, other channels to get information um, that can be trusted, and, and even uh, talking amongst your community to um, help correct potential disinformation that might be. Uh, when it comes to impersonation, the same tools financially motivated actors use to gain access to sensitive information can also be co-opted by malicious actors who want to undermine trust. Um, so if you see if you see a request that feels off, like a request for sensitive information or personal information, uh, you might want to verify that through secondary channels and, and focus on strong cybersecurity like enabling multi-factor authentication protect, to help protect against identity theft, phishing, or malware. It, it's all more important in the age of generative AI. <laughs> so I already mentioned some common things to look out for. <clears throat> um, if you suspected image is AI generated, um, but I would note that, you know, the technology is rapidly advancing, right? And so some of the items that I'm going to note here have a potential um, to might no longer be the case uh, in the near future. Uh, but I still want to note it because it's still worthy for awareness, especially if you, you see these types of abnormalities. Um, so AI generators often mis make mistakes with glasses. As you see in the top right, you can see the top image. Um, the glasses disappear. Um, on Then on the bottom, you have the deep fake of the Pope that went viral. You know, he, um, you know, it's quite trendy here. Um, but, it, you know, if you see the hands, there's only four fingers. Um, and finally, uh, I'll just round out um, here is that, you know, with the extraordinary potential held out by AI, it demands a society wide effort. You know, so the um, executive order 104110, or the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial and AI, was recently released on October 30th. Um, that directs federal agencies to identify risks and develop new use cases, formed a new White House AI Council, um, and additional directives will also be issued by federal agencies to, um, you know, navigate the potential risks. 
And then uh, CISA uh, in mid-November of this year released our agency's roadmap. Um, so as the nation's cyber defense agency and coordinator for election security resilience, um, we, we're going to play a key role here in working with election officials to help manage those risks. Um, and um, but really, this is an opportunity for CISA to apply a whole of agency plan uh, aligned with national strategy to promote beneficial uses of AI, assure those systems, and also assess potential risk. So you can find more information at CISA.gov uh, backslash AI if you want to find some more information about that. Um, and with that, um, I will transition back to you, Judd, to take us into the next part of the session. Yeah, thank you very much, Margo. That was very comprehensive, and I really appreciate all the detail you put into that. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. So let me uh, start us off by saying, let's say I'm an elections administrator. And so honestly, that's not a big leap, but let's say I'm an elections administrator and I wanted to protect myself from possible AI um, problems associated with the upcoming 2024 cycle, which we're all on the edge of our seat about, uh, what what would be your sort of top list of things that an election professional should do? What information should we have or what people should we be talking to? What things should we, we, we be reading? Those kinds of things. Yeah, I really uh, appreciate the, the question. Um, so from an individual standpoint, um, I would say, much like an organization, um, cybersecurity best practices still apply for when it comes to artificial intelligence. So um, that that has never changed, right? But AI might make it a little more complex to uh, push back on it. So personally, um, things that you can look at um, still apply, like um, making sure you have multi-factor authentication on your accounts, um, taking a look at um, what type of information is out there about yourself? Because AI um, is going to gather all that information, and and adversaries can kind of collect that and you know make targeted appeals to you to try to scam you and stuff. Um, so those are, are two immediate areas that I would take focus on. Um, but I also would echo what we would initially start with with a lot of election officials, especially if we were coming in for the first time um, for a CISO interacting with them is uh, focus on building relationships. Um, so you want to you want to get to know um, who your law enforcement officials are if you don't haven't already done so, or um, getting connected with your uh, FBI election crimes coordinator and certainly CISO's regional staff that are out there uh, with our cybersecurity, protective security, um, and election security advisors. All of them can help not only strengthen your posture as an organization, but um, a lot of those same benefits and understanding can be applied to, to your individual self. And following up on that, are there, uh, are there, is there open conversation between public security and uh, folks like yourself and the press? So that when something arises, so when something pops up uh, in a campaign or in some elections related activity, the general public would become aware of, hey, you shouldn't pay attention to this. You should, this is not uh, a real or substantive, um, you know, information that is generated by AI for that reason should be going. Yeah, yeah. So um, we we certainly do our best to um, get information out there, right? Um, so there's a lot of uh, typical channels, especially for election officials that are already plugged in. But if you're not aware, there's channels like the Election Infor Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the EII Center, um, that is really like a primary channel to get information out to election officials. Um, but Similarly, if there is something that arises to a certain level um, that can have like a profound impact to national security, um, there are mechanisms to help get that information out there to not only election officials, but to make sure the, the public and voters are aware of a more sophisticated um, you know, campaign that could be out there. Um, and you also see some of that information coming out in, in products that get developed, right? Like you might have 
um, entities like the FBI releasing information about potential scams that gets out to, you know, and that shared with the press to make sure people are aware of new and evolving campaigns. Um, but certainly um, out here is uh, on, on the election security front with CISA, we're working really closely with the election stakeholders so that they can continue to help push out accurate information themselves. But um, we are involved with other stakeholders to make sure they're aware of um, what the what the threat landscape looks like. And are you aware? I'm I'm not. Um, uh, are you aware of any states that are sort of proactively reaching out to voters, alerting them for a potential AI? I know we in Colorado we sort of talked about it, but I don't think we have a current plan to do outreach. Uh, and is that a good idea? So I always think it's a great idea to help educate on um, what the election process looks like. You know, whether that is focused on um, just what to expect when showing up to vote, uh, but certainly it would be good to have awareness on um, what are evolving concerns that are out there. So, because there is something to be said about um, building resilience with, among the voters and uh, just the general public so that if, if they're seeing something that doesn't seem right or doesn't, it seems a little out of place for what they are expecting on election day, they are also able to push back on that, not just election officials. Um, so uh, I'm not aware off the top of my head of any specific campaign um, out there. Um, doesn't mean it's not happening, um, but I know there's uh, a number of states that have active uh, education campaigns um, and I and I, I think this is a relatively newer topic, if you will, in the election space. That um, you'll probably can, you'll probably see some adjustments going forward, um, and 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 how they're approaching education to make sure that um, the public and voters have as much as possible to um, be aware of how um, AI can impact the election process. So I'll, I'll put you on the spot for one more quick question. Uh, we're about out of time, but so I don't, but, and I don't want to get you in trouble. So, so be careful. Uh, when, when, uh, when would it be appropriate for the federal government to get involved in an AI issue? When, what, what is your role? What's CISA's role? It, at, at, uh, if there was a, an AI uh, campaign related or even election related incident uh, where you all might be involved. So uh, this is really grounded in um, threats and impacts to critical infrastructure. Um, so when it comes to AI, when there's something that, uh, when there's a, a risk that's out there, uh, AI can really exacerbate existing um, uh, cyber physical threats out there to election infrastructure. So. Um, if there is something that's out there that could have a perceived risk on um, elections, so again, that infrastructure's people, facilities, equipment, whatever, um, you know, one, we're going to try to educate on the potential risk and identify um, measures to help build resilience and protection against the threat. Um, but also, if there is a direct impact, um, either there was a cyber campaign that um, impacted the election jurisdiction or there's a physical threat to an election worker or to the facility itself. Those are all things where CISO would want to know about it um, because we have resources that can be deployed to help immediately. Um, and certainly we can coordinate with federal partners to provide assistance depending on what the scenario is. So any, any real perceived threat is something that we want to be aware of to educate, but also um, to also help support in case of things. Okay, great. Uh, you meandered past my question really well, uh, but good good job. Uh, so there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat that uh, center about or uh, center on uh, state legislation. I just want to note that Washington State has passed legislation, Michigan has passed legislation, Colorado is going to have legislation this upcoming cycle. Uh, I I know of a couple of other states where I've I've talked to either legislators or the people that are sort of in policy circles. So these, there are states out there that are moving pretty aggressively on this. And there uh, are even nonprofits who are sort of uh, creating model legislation. Uh, so uh, we should really seek out uh, the opportunities that exist out there so that you can learn more about 
ways that you can protect you and your state from uh, AI as it uh, is unfortunately um, uh, causing you issues. And But I would note that today, if you were reading the captions, that was AI generated media captioning uh, that was on this very uh, program. So uh, AI isn't all bad. Uh, there are good ways to use it. Colorado and other states use it for signature verification. So uh, thank you very much, Michael. That was fantastic. Really appreciate your uh, joining us today. I know we're just slightly over, but let me uh, once again uh, alert you to the fact that we at the CEA program at the University of Minnesota would invite you to uh, take a class or two or maybe even sign up for our certificate program there on the screen is the way to learn more. If you search in Google or your favorite search engine for HHHCEA, you can learn more. Uh, also, these are the classes that we're teaching in January and then in March, uh, my class on election law, and then uh, voter participation with uh, Gina Roberts, and then Maurice Turner is gonna teach election security class uh, starting in March. Really encourage you to sign up for those courses. Get a flavor of what the CEA program is all about. And if you thought to yourself, hey, I'd love to be an elections administrator, well, this is a great place to start. Or I'm an elections administrator, but I want to sort of get a head start on the future in that career. That's a great place to go. So anyway, that's where you learn more. Uh, thank you again so much for being here. And we'll be back in February with a new webinar. Look at your email for updates on uh, what that topic will be and when to put it on your calendar. Thanks again, Michael, and thanks everybody for joining. Really appreciate it.